Hello, my name is Simone Dewing and I work in education at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. You're tuning into a virtual museum visit. Tonight, we're pleased to be joined by Melanie Herzog, Professor Emerita of Art History at Edgewood College, here to talk with us about the art of Gladys Nilsson, whose work is on view at the museum in the Henry Street Gallery, now through June 6, 2021. Melanie's areas of expertise include North American art and visual culture, with an emphasis on race, ethnicity, gender and representation, and cross-cultural exchanges among artists. Um, we're thrilled to have her here tonight. Um, for tonight's event, we're going to begin by playing a pre-recorded gallery talk. Um, thanks to Marian Herzog um, for recording that video for us, um, after which Melanie will join us live and in person for the Q&A portion of the event. So with that, um, I will get this video started. Thanks for joining us tonight and um, stay tuned for the gallery talk. First, thank you to Sherry Castelnuovo, Curator of Education for the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art for decades and who is soon retiring. Sherry, thank you for educating students of all ages from Madison and beyond, for facilitating the preparation of museum docents who guide museum tours, for your brilliant and creative programming that has brought insight and understanding of the work of an astonishing range of contemporary art and for your continued efforts to broaden the, the audience for the museum and make Amoca a welcoming and inclusive space for everyone in this community. You will be missed, and I, along with many people, wish you a glorious retirement filled with new adventures. And thank you to Gladys Nilsson, who for decades has painted these images of playful, tantalizing, spirited women that are now on view in Emoka's Henry Street Gallery. In this historical moment where joy is hard to come by, Nilsson's paintings and prints truly bring me joy. I picture her in her studio, in a house in the town I grew up in, a suburb of Chicago where I'm not sure how many people know what's going on in that studio. I picture these audacious women, larger than life, dancing out of Ms. Nilsson's light-filled attic studio into the quiet, tree-lined streets, still bricked rather than paved, to the astonishment and perhaps the joy of her neighbors. Gladys Nilsson recently celebrated her 80th birthday. She's a lifelong Chicagoan who grew up taking classes and attending programs at the Art Institute, visually absorbing art from all over the world that she saw in the Art Institute's galleries. She studied at the School of the Art Institute where she painted mostly in oil paint. She met other artists, including her husband, Jim Nutt, and with these artists, she famously became a member of the Harry Who. If you can, visit Emoka to see the exhibition of Chicago Imagists in the main galleries upstairs, and you'll see her work in the context of these artists. When she was pregnant with her son, Claude, she began painting in watercolors because watercolor is safer than oil, and she was concerned, she says, about her tender-skinned baby. She has continued to work in watercolor while also exploring other drawing and printmaking, both etching and monotype, and painting mediums, and incorporating collage into her works. She received her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in 1965. She and Jim Nutt spent a little less than a decade in California from 1969 to 1976, where Nutt was teaching drawing, but then they returned to the Chicago area in 1976. In 1990, she began teaching classes at the School of the Art Institute, where as a member of the Department of Painting and Drawing faculty, she teaches classes in drawing and mixed media. In a New York Times article about Nilsson earlier this year, Jonathan Griffin had this to say about the Harry Who. This is a quote. Their art could be caustic, outré, vulgar and loud, psychedelic patterns and clashing colors abounded. It was bad taste and brilliant fun. Tattoos, graffiti, comic books, fanzines, games and toys, newspaper and magazine advertisements were all influences, as was the encyclopedic global collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. Rooted in the surrealist traditions of Chicago's art scene, it was unlike anything else in America at that time. So Gladys Nilsson's work was vulgar and fun, yes, but it's more ironic, I think, than caustic. She's not unkind. As she told Griffin, she said, I love all the people in my paintings. I would take care of them, no matter what they look like or what they are doing. 
They might be misguided, they might be a little naughty, but they're nice, because I'm nice. Some of her early images evoke cartoons or comics of the 1960s and 70s with areas of flat color filling clearly outlined figures that engage in a playful dialogue with the pop art of the time. Her later work is larger, as you see here. Her lines and handling of color more fluid and layered, deliberately harmonious or sometimes jarring. Collaged elements might comprise parts of a figure or serve as adornments. And you can see some of those collage images upstairs in the Chicago Images show, but not in this space. I want to say a little bit about those collage images because I think they help make sense of some of the ways that she works with imagery in her painting. Sometimes she would cut those images, little pictures, out from art history books. You might think about um, Janssen's History of Art that some of us might have used in school, which until the 1980s included no women artists, although at the Art Institute or the School of the Art Institute, they used Helen Gardner's Art Through the Ages. Gardner taught there. She actually taught the first art history classes at the School of the Art Institute and wrote her book based on her teaching. So if you think about kind of that context when you look at those collages, that'll help you think about the ways that some of the fig smaller figures in her collaged paintings that bring art historical representations of women into a kind of dialogue or conversation with each other, a visual relationship that also suggests something of human relationships. Other figures or parts of figures are cut from fashion magazines, magazines that Nilsson says she finds ridiculous, but she also says she loves to look at the clothes and the fabric. So there's a kind of a critique of art historical representation of women, a narrow view by a limited scope of artists, and a critique of fashion magazines representations of women, another narrow view of what bodies are the right bodies in her collages and perhaps also in the paintings and the prints that are here in the Henry Street Gallery. But her exuberant bodies that are often adorned in a manner that she describes as excessive refuse to be contained or bound within the rules of art history or the normative definitions of beauty. These women also exceed the boundaries of the architectural or natural spaces that they occupy. In questionable place over here, the large woman simply does not fit in the ambiguous constructed space that's neither inside nor outside in which she's framed. This is a, it's a fantastical, oddly proportioned space rendered with a kind of disjunctive perspective. It's a physically questionable place, the title of the work, that asks us to consider what places for women, domestic, public, or spaces in between, might not be questionable. The woman has a dog, and the leash of the dog is wrapped around her legs, like the improbable adornments worn by the women in some of her other works. And that leash is also, it, it becomes a form of constraint, not just for the dog, but for the woman whose legs are tangled up in it. And that leash is held by a very tiny man with a very tiny dog at the lower right corner of the painting. And the woman's dog is interested in something else very tiny, a little doorway, a very small doorway through what initially looks like a kind of maroonish, purplish floor. And through that doorway is the outdoors. It's filled with light. It's filled with trees. So that's outside. So perhaps we're inside. There's also a window above the little tiny person with the little tiny dog in the corner. So where is this woman? What's going to happen next? We don't know. This is one of those enigmatic stories that Nilsson tells, or perhaps she's inviting us to write our own story about it. Nilsson is a consummate colorist. Her handling of watercolor is delicate, subtle, and gorgeous. But the subtlety of her handling of this medium does not extend to her figures. They are bold, they're sly, they're sassy. They are the central protagonists in stories that are provocative and fantastical, and as we saw in A Questionable Place, they're also enigmatic. Nilsson knows her art history, certainly. In the European paintings that populate the Art Institute and those books that she cuts up sometimes, 
She knows the lineage of representations of women who are saintly or seductive, modest or sensuously voluptuous, all filtered through the desires of the painter and his audience, and it is mostly his audience, and the gender norms of their time, along with the norms attached to social locations like race and ethnicity and class. In some of her small paintings, there's a, a kind of nod to the densely packed morality scenes of me medieval illuminated manuscripts and paintings by artists like Hieronymus Bosch. In giant paintings, she transforms voluptuous women of artists like Peter Paul Rubens into emphatic assertions of female agency. And I think that's some of what's going on here in Big Girl from 2009. But these art historical images are not the direct antecedents for her women, though she sometimes nods to them or borrows bits and pieces in visual references or literally through those collaged elements. Along with those art historical references, she also attends to the imagery of popular culture that I noted before. Think of advertising um, and women's magazines, imagery that finds its way into her paintings as fragments or sometimes as visual references or in the boundless disregard for those rules and the ideals for bodies and fashion. So here's the woman in Big Girl, much larger than anybody else in this painting. She engages the viewer directly, seemingly untroubled by the cats lying on her head and around her neck. And she's dressed in a rather fabulous ensemble. She's got a polka dot blouse, a mottled skirt with shorts peeking out from underneath, kind of like the bike shorts that are a fashion right now, and unforgettable red high-heeled shoes. She appears comfortable in her sturdy, aging body. Filled with lush patterns derived from the natural world, this painting is vertically divided into two sections. The woman, called the big girl, fills the section that has colors and patterns suggesting a wooded landscape. And then there are smaller figures populating the space around her legs, one reaching across a table that bridges the land and the water sections. There are a whole lot more of these smaller figures who are floating on a winding kind of ribbon-like river that curves and twists through this scene. So here's this woman on one side, but with all this other action going on on the other side of the painting, bringing her and perhaps bringing us into this kind of liminal space between land and water, the wild and the domestic. Again, an enigmatic narrative, and perhaps there are multiple stories here. Nilsson began making images of women in the 1960s. She has repeatedly said that Chicago's art world was much more welcoming of women artists than other places such as New York or California. And she was astonished, actually, by her experiences of marginalization as a woman artist during her years in Sacramento. Still, balancing motherhood and art making is not easy. And watercolor, a medium historically associated with women and domestic artistic production, was not nearly as respected a medium as oil paints. So she had some challenges. Still, she became a consummate watercolorist, we can see in an untitled painting how her early watercolors translate the forms, patterns, and colors of 1960s pop culture, particularly posters and albums, into this more fluid medium with subtle, sometimes lyrical gradations of color bounded by confident, drawn outlines. Now these words, fluid, delicate, subtle, lyrical, and patterned, these are words to be used carefully and deliberately as they have been deployed to denigrate women painters whose handling of their mediums is brilliant and accomplished. Nilsson seems relatively unconcerned by such matters. Indeed, while she came of age in a historical moment when some women artists were reclaiming women's media and imagery that had been dismissed or marginalized, she didn't take up this fight. Watercolor and collage, yes, in a manner that is perhaps a bit subversive, but she's not throwing down a challenge to the art world, even in California, where artists like Judy Chicago and Miriam Shapiro were marshalling women to interrogate and reclaim the female body as an artistic subject and to employ practices like collage or what Shapiro called femage. 
Women artists did engage the body as an assertion of female agency. For example, uh, painters like Alice Neal, Joan Semmel, Faith Ringgold, who painted, paints still, and works in textiles, painter Joan Brown, who was also in California. But Nilsson just wanted to paint. Representation of the female body is also a lineage, though a wildly disparate one, in the art of Chicago women. Nilsson was preceded by artists like Gertrude Abercrombie, whose loosely autobiographical images are variously unsettling and kind of enigmatic, like Nilsson's, and Julia Thekla, whose images of women are magical and dreamlike. Sue Ellen Rocha, another Harry Who artist, whose work is also upstairs, looked to pop culture and advertising's prescriptive images of women in her images of the body. And after Nilsson in this lineage come people like Christina Ramberg, whose work is also upstairs, whose images of women show the body bound and constrained in ways that suggest both phys physical and social limits on women. And then, of course, Hollis Sigler, whose work implies women's presence, but in which the body itself is absent, even though so much of her work is all about the body. From the beginning of her career, Nilsson brought her own sense of humor and audacity to depicting the female body. As Robert Casolino and others have noted, the body is a prominent subject in the work of the Harry Who. Casolino writes, quote, they delight in its imperfections as smells seep out, flesh sags and meanders, pimples and hair erupt in unexpected places, and all falls into disorienting fragments. Many images combine loath loathsomeness and desirability, sensuality and repulsion, each body asserting its way in the world regardless of shape. What some critics considered juvenile shock material was part of a long tradition of using the body and bodily to contemplate our mortality and humanity. Now, repulsion and loathsomeness are not Nilsson's approach. There, there might be some viewers who find her exaggerated, unapologetic, aging bodies repulsive. But for Nilsson, this is simply a part of life, unavoidable if one lives long enough. Beginning with her work from the 1960s and, instead, and extending through her current bountifully large paintings, Nilsson's representations of the female body are shaped by her keen observation of human behavior, her inimitable wit, the wisdom she has gained through lived experience, and her fantastical imagination. Playful and ironic, somewhat magical, her imagery is densely packed and richly patterned. There are scenes of passion, sensuous abandon, and luscious foodstuffs. These are scenes that are populated with women who do not deny themselves bodily pleasure. The figures are stylized with elements of their anatomy sometimes exaggerated or distorted as a kind of visual punctuation within the story she's telling, though we don't always know what that story is. She told Jonathan Griffin, I love to watch people. I collect postures in my mind when somebody doesn't think that they're on stage, so to speak, when they're slumped or moving in a strange or exaggerated manner. So let's look at the painting called Pearly Shade. It's a watercolor and gouache painting from 2005. Like the central figure in Pearly Shade, her women are sometimes clothed, sometimes not, and Nilsson clearly revels in the physicality of their bodies. Their reach is sometimes magically extended in a kind of embodied desire Postures and gestures, too, evoke aspects of somebody's persona, somebody's character. And in Pearly Shade, as in the other works that we've looked at, she abandons perspective and any sense of rational scale as the distorted, pearlescent figure appears to be balanced on one leg and one impossibly curved arm. And her other arm arcs above her to peel her dress from her body while she floats in this improbable space that's a very visually dense space. This woman is spectacular in multiple senses of the world, word. She is immense and gorgeous, and she is intensely looked upon by the smaller figures who surround her and inspect parts of her body. A dreamlike, fantastical scene that once again tells a story we can't quite apprehend, or maybe she's inventing us to write our own stories about these exuberant bodies 
to fill the gaps in the limited stories of women that art history offers us. Nilsen has spent her life looking at art, at the world, at people, at the visual imagery that pervades vernacular or popular culture, at human interactions with all of their or our vanity, foolishness, and sensuous delight. As she's aged, her representations of women draw upon her entire life experience. She says, the female figure has taken over because the older I get, the more I think back on the women in my life, aunties and grandmas and cousins. You know, people joke about, well, everything is wrinkled and sagging and bagging and all that kind of stuff. I've always thought it was kind of fun inadvertently exploring what stage I am in life. Like the women she portrays, Gladys Nilsson's artistic vision is playful, tantalizing, spirited, and audacious. Let's not take this too seriously, she seems to say. At the same time, her tenacity as an artist must be reckoned with. Having drawn all her life, she began painting as an oil painter, then she took up watercolor as her primary medium to protect her baby, and it was something she could do at home. In California, that environment that she found much less hospitable to women, she kept painting while taking care of her child while her husband taught and also continued to paint. Now she has a fabulous studio and a teaching position that takes her back again into the Art Institute where she found so much inspiration as a child and as a young woman. All the while, over the course of decades, she populated her paintings with these exuberant, uncontained women. I hope you have the opportunity to see this show in Amoka's Henry Street Gallery in person. My thanks to Amoka and my thanks to Gladys Nilsson. All right, so now we are here um, IRL um, in real life with, with Melanie Herzog. Um, we're so grateful to have you, um, you know, come back and to, to talk with us a little more about Gladys Nelson's work. And I thought that was a really wonderful introduction to, um, especially to her subject matter and, and the care and, and joy and humor that she brings to her work. Um, did, that, uh, did watching that back bring anything up for you? Um, I mean, welcome, <laughs> if you want to say anything first. <laughs> First, thank you so much for this opportunity. I was delighted to be invited to present a gallery talk and to have the opportunity to record in the gallery. My thanks to Marion for being our videographer. And I am so honored to be here and to be able to talk with people this evening about Gladys Nilsson's work. I have to say there's some sort of odd out of body experience that happens watching a video of yourself talking um, <laughs> in the summertime in the gallery um, while sitting in, here I am sitting in my house. Um, but watching it, I was, I was struck again by the, the lush richness of those images and by her, her handling of her mediums as well. And I wish that in the video we could have shown people the entire show, but hopefully people can go and see it themselves. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I, uh, just so viewers um, are aware, the show is up through June 6th and you can um, visit emoca.org and go to our um, current exhibitions page. And if you go to the Gladys Nilsson show, there's actually a 3D uh, virtual tour. So you can um, see all the work kind of as it's laid out um, and as the, the curator uh, Mel intended. So um, that's a nice treat uh, for those of you who are at home. Um, and we do have a question uh, that came in from Ashley. Um, and so I will read it here and I'll also paste it in so you can have it for reference. But um, Ashley says, do you think Nelson ignores realist slash realistic perspective because realism has mostly been a genre for or about men and because women's stories have never fit in those master plots. Is this kind of an antidote to the quote unquote male gaze? Ashley, that's a brilliant question. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's interesting because I think that there have been women working in the, in the Western European tradition at any rate, who have worked with realism for some sorts of subject matter. But when I think about representation of the body, and I think about sort of that art historical narrative that I referenced in the talk, because women artists, once art academies were formed, women artists for the most part weren't allowed to 
work from the human body. It was, it would have been unseemly, certainly inappropriate for women to draw and paint um, or sculpt from the body. Women weren't allowed to do that. So it's interesting, as I think about your question, on some level, I think perhaps artists, women artists who engage the body are taking on a subject that for so long was denied women artists working in that tradition. Again, a tradition that Nilsson is so strongly aware of. I think at the same time, the way in which her figures and her approach to painting exceed so many boundaries, right? They refuse to be contained. They're barely contained within the frames of her paper or her canvases. And, um, you know, the figures oftentimes are so large, they exceed any sort of um, social boundaries in terms of bodies or the place that women occupy or social roles or what aging women are supposed to be and do that perhaps the realism that she would certainly have been, would be capable of if she wanted to use that as her style, perhaps, perhaps you're onto something that this is a way for her to also kind of exceed that perspective and perhaps it is a way to shift or maybe subvert that male gaze and to kind of break free of those master narratives or master plots. Thanks, Melanie. And thanks, Ashley, for your question. Um, if you're just tuning in, we're talking to Melanie Herzog, Professor Emerita of Art History at Edgewood College. Um, about the work of Gladys Nelson, um, which is on view in the Henry Street Gallery at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, so we hope that you ask questions uh, if you're tuning in. Um, in particular, I know um, I had one for Melanie, um, you know, earlier before we started the live stream, you were talking about um, just Nelson's technique and um, how incredible really it is to see such large scale watercolors, um, you know, first of all. Um, and also, you know, she wasn't just, uh, you know, she didn't just restrict herself to watercolors and you know, she used gouache and, um, you know, made prints, this um, etching in Aquatint um, next to the big girl, I think, um, that Wisconsin themed one, I can't remember the title of it, but, um, you know, collage, she does all kinds of things. So um, just speaking a little bit to her technical prowess um, and then um, just, yeah, how, how, how you see that manifesting in her work. Well, she works in so many different mediums. And one of the things that I think is so lovely about this show in the Henry Street Gallery is that even though that's a relatively small space, there are examples of Nilsson's work in a variety of media. So people can go into that space and see her working in watercolor and using various watercolor techniques. You might see more kind of opaque application of watercolor where the colors are really rich and dense and saturated where there's more pigment and less water, right? Because watercolor is basically water and, and minerals, pigment mixed together. So with watercolor, you can make paints that are more opaque or translucent or even almost transparent if it's mostly water and less color. And so you see her really thinking about all the different ways that you can work with this medium you can paint with watercolor paints on dry paper where you can have outlines and kind of fill them in and the color stays more contained. Or you can paint on wet paper where the paint just sort of bleeds out into areas. And she did that with some of the really, um, the wonderful gradations of color where one color flows into another. Uh, she also sometimes in a watercolor painting might use gouache, which is kind of think a really thick opaque watercolor. So another water-based paint, but it's, but it's thicker. She, there are also examples of her painting with acrylic, which, which essentially is like a plastic based um, paint where she paints with it on plexiglass in ways that, and this is, this is taking my head back to um, Ashley's question, where I think about traditions of stained glass, right? Religious traditions. I think about traditions of people who couldn't afford stained glass who might paint on the back of glass to make what looks like sort of a, a lower cost version of stained glass. But then you think about in an era of prefabricated plastic materials, painting with acrylic on plexiglass to get a sort of 
modern, a modern kind of retake of that tradition with these industrial lower cost, easier to transport sorts of materials. Um, you mentioned also that there are prints in the show, there are etchings, there are etchings. She oftentimes combines mediums. So etching combined with dry point. For etching, you put um, a surface on a metal plate and then you, you scratch through that. You put, it's called a ground. You scratch through that to expose the metal. Then when you etch it, which is why it's called an etching, you've got little lines in that plate that you can force ink into to print. Well, you can also scratch directly into the plate. So that's what's called dry point. You can also put another kind of speckledy textured surface onto the plate that when you then etch it, you get a rough textured surface that allows you to get different gradations of tone rather than having to use scratched marks to get those gradations of tone. You can use layers of paper that pick up ink in different ways to get gradations and patterns and different kinds of detail. So there's really an astonishing range of mediums that are in this exhibition. And you can see that this is an artist who understands deeply what the visual and material qualities are that you get when you work with those different mediums in those different ways. So what might look like a kind of Casual, simply casual, fun, spontaneous sort of image has embedded in it this really deep understanding of materials and their properties and how to use them. And if there's anybody here, I can't see a list of who's here with us this evening. So if there happen to be any printmakers or watercolorists or other artists who are here, if you want to add anything in to um, either deepen folks' understanding of those mediums or to correct anything I might have gotten wrong, please type that in and Simone will share that out with the rest of us. Yeah, thank you for that um, that reminder that um, as viewers, we hope that, you, that you're participating and that can mean answering questions too if we don't have the answers. Um, don't just ask questions. If there's something that you're thinking, which again, going back to Ashley's question, I know that in some ways your question has answers and fuller kind of participation in a conversation. In it. So if people want to join in, right, Q and A doesn't just mean Q from you and A from me. So if folks want to jump into the conversation, please do. Absolutely. Um, do you want to take a stab at one of the, the questions we discussed earlier? Maybe um, what sets Nilsson's work apart from, from the other images? I know we're kind of jumping around, but um, you know, other members of the Harry Who, um, and you know, maybe in your own words, who the Chicago Imagists were and, and her role in that. I would say, uh, I think I'm gonna go to the, the part of your question about what sets her work apart. Um, I think in some ways her work has some similarities with that of other Harry Who artists in her engagement with popular culture, in her absolute irreverence and um, refusal to be contained by social expectation and art world expectations. I think where her work perhaps differs or where, where I see it being set apart is in the way in which she engages with the body. There are a lot of images of the body in the work of the Harry who they're Chicago images, right? So they're working with images and a lot of those are the body, but there's something I keep coming back to that word exuberant or playful or um, outrageous or disobedient about Gladys Nilsson's bodies that both in terms of her handling of her medium, her mediums and the looseness of her work, they refuse to be contained. And also in her images and her themes, the motifs that play through her paintings and the way that she works with the body. I think there's a, a looseness that I don't see in quite the same way. There are other, there's certainly other rule breakers among the Chicago images. And that's one of the things that's so fabulous about the Harry Who. Um, but I think with Nilsson, there's something about those 
kind of boundless bodies that I don't see in the other work in the same way. If you go, if you look at her work in relation to other work of um, Chicago imagists, even without reading the tag, if you're not a person who's steeped in art history, or is, if you're not somebody who feels like you're really practiced in looking at art, if I was a betting woman, I would wager that if you walk into an exhibition of the Chicago images, you will know which are the works of Gladys Nilsson. Yeah, totally. I think, um, sorry, what's up? I was just saying, does that answer that for you? Simone? I think so, yeah. And I think part of that question does come from, um, you know, this, this desire um, or just kind of his, historical impetus to, to group artists together and, and to kind of celebrate this, this community that they created for themselves, um, you know, being based um, out of the SAIC and, and having kind of these roots in Chicago. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all their work, um, you know, looks the same or that they're all kind of doing, you know, it's not, it's, there's so much life to each of their unique styles. And I think that um, with Gladys, I think it, it kind of deviates even more so just with that, um, as you said, those kind of, you have to use those words carefully, but the, the, the delicate and, and, um, and uh, oh God, I'm losing my words. Um, her sort of the subtlety to her, to her watercolor, you know, her rendering is, um, but then the subject matter is, as you said, just totally wild and, and kind of, you know, hits you in the face. And so it's like this, this really nice tension that I think, um, you know, it just kind of envelops you. It really swallows you. I think when you're, when you're looking at the work. Yeah, and I love that you use that word tension because I think in some ways there is a kind of tension or maybe what some people might see as a disjuncture between that delicate, lyrical, flowing, right? The watercolor, it just flows. Her gouache just flows. Her lines flow and curve and one figure kind of flows and streams across and into another. And so we can think about all of that, you know, delicate and pattern and light and lyrical, right? Those just gendered, they're so gender laden, those words in the way that art gets talked about in these images that are completely outrageous and rule breaking and excessive in terms of exceeding all of those rules and boundaries. And so, you know, those, those things don't always go together. And I think it is in that tension or that rub that there's something so interesting and compelling happening in her work. And, you know, if you think about the Harry Who as a group of young artists hanging out together, taking classes together, being friends with each other, they had no intention of all doing the same kind of work. They're all engaging with some of the, some of the same issues, questions, again, those ideas about what's happening in the world and what's happening in popular culture and what is what does it mean to be a young art student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in those years. And they came together to show together, but I imagine that they never thought that they would somehow be grouped as some sort of unit, almost like some sort of a school. It's like, you know, you get a group of your friends together and you take over some space, whether you get offered space or you rent space or you squat in space, whatever you do, right? You may not think about it as this is going to mark us forever as being somehow artistically, stylistically, conceptually joined, right? Any of you who are here who are artists, um, think about times when you may have just figured out how to get a show together. Totally. Um, sorry, I should have muted my phone. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, I think you're right. It's just that kind of organic, you know, pollination that happens when groups of people get together and, and the possibilities of, of collaboration. And that's one thing that I also love about the, the images. And I know we're here tonight to talk mostly about, um, about Nilsson, but just the fact that she was a part of this really close, um, you know, artistic community, I think, um, I think it's just a really wonderful, um, a wonderful thing. And I think, um, you know, we, we try to recreate that, I think, in our, in our own lives, right? We try to have these connections with each other um, uh, through the arts and through, you know, meetups and things like that. So I think it's, it's the fact that that happened so in such a robust and, and rich way, I think is really, is really lovely. Um, here's a question from Carrie, um, who says, 
Uh, adding in the factor of aging to represent the female form seems to magnify her work as inclusive and different, especially with the gleeful and unapologetic feel. Are there other threads of representing aging that Gladys was responding to from the same time, if not from the Chicago Imagists? You know, that's such a, an interesting question, that question of threads of representing aging, because in some ways, I think aging, we look at aging where it crosses with gender, has been something where the aging female body either becomes invisible or becomes kind of the quiet grandma in the corner. Um, I don't think that there are a lot of spaces where aging women have been represented so holistically and so playfully. Um, I love your words in your question, gleeful and apologetic I, and unapologetic. I think that so often there is almost this kind of apology that does go along with images of aging women, which are different from images of aging men, where there's a kind of you know, venerated wisdom that comes with, with aging. So I'm not sure what other threads of representing aging in a way that felt positive, gleeful, unapologetic she may have been drawing upon. I wonder if perhaps she felt the need to represent them or feels the need to represent them because they are so little represented or because aging when it's sometimes represented by artists even now is something to be kind of reckoned with, whether it's to make peace with it or deal with your anger about it. Um, that print of Judy Chicago's comes to mind, the one that was the Madison Print Club print a few years back, some of you may be familiar with it, um, where there's, there's kind of almost there's defiance mixed with anger, mixed with sorrow in a way. And in Nilsson's work, she, she doesn't seem sorry at all. Do you think, is there, I, um, I, I agree. I'm curious, do you think there's any, um, is there a darkness underlying any of this? Like, do you see any sort of um, pain or anything permeating her work? I mean, I see it on the surface as, as um, everything that you've described. Um, and it just like makes you wonder, you know, if there's something underneath. <laughs> I mean, I see, I see curiosity in her work. You know, she, I quoted her in my talk where she talks about kind of being curious about what those next stages of life are going to be. Um, I think there's probably more introspection that informs these works and maybe we initially see on the surface that maybe that's kind of layered under or layered into the colors and the patterns and the organic quality and the exuberance that there are those additional layers. I mean, it's very layered work. So if you think about those layers of materials and layers of images and of colors and patterns, certainly suggest a kind of layering of ideas, thoughts, feelings that are there as well. So I, I think, I think you're right that it's not just about being joyous and exuberant and all of that. At the same time, that is a way of claiming a sort of presence that I think all too often is denied to aging women in visual culture as any sort of positive image. I'm curious what other people think about that. If anyone wants to put something into the chat, jump in, tell us what you think. Yes, please. I'm, uh, I'm looking at the chat now and it's, it's ready for your questions. <laughs> um, I think on that note too, um, I'm, I'm curious uh, in, in seeing the exhibition as a whole. And um, uh, I think you mentioned that she started to paint or paint, sorry, she started to, um, you know, create images um, and all kinds of media of, of uh, aging women in the 60s. Um, 
like how how did the her bodies change you know over time or because I think the show includes work you know as recent as you know the 2000s late 2000s so 2010s I'm curious what you think um about that I think the figures change and so I I wouldn't kind of limit the images by saying they're autobiographical because I think there's a lot more going on here but I think her willingness to engage with the reality of the human body when we live on a planet with gravity and what does gravity do to a body, right? She, she goes there in the 2000s in a way that she certainly didn't in the 60s. I mean, in the 60s, there's, there's so much in her work that kind of resonates with pop art and popular culture. And, you know, she was a lot younger then. In the 60s, she was in her 20s. She was born in 1940. So in the 60s, she's in her 20s. She's got a very different relationship to her own body and to what it means to be in the world as a person, as a woman, as an artist. So you kind of, you wouldn't see, or I, or I wouldn't expect to see the same kinds of almost felt from within images of the body. So as we look through the decades, it would be really interesting to kind of line up the images in the show chronologically um, and to think about how do the, what happens to those bodies? How do those bodies look and feel and how do those bodies engage the world, right? And of course, they're not really, they're representations. So how do those representations of the body suggest ways of engaging the world as one moves through life? And how does one maintain that kind of um, boundary, unapologetic, if I can borrow Carrie's word, um, unapologetic, excessive, you know, boundary breaking when as, as one's body ages, more limits oftentimes get placed on women and the female body. And she just keeps breaking those rules. Mm -hmm. And I like, um, on that the thread of being unapologetic, I think um, even more delightful to think about in 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 the face of this like heavy advertising and the the kind of beauty culture that that a lot of the images were were drawing inspiration from or kind of teasing and and I think um, you think about the extremities you know of of the body when you know um, when people are trying to change their bodies you know according to kind of these these um, standards that. Um, that are you know propagandized and fed to us. So I think it's in a way it's sort of like um, I don't know. It seems to be almost like ignoring that complete, or it's like it's not even uh, an issue or something for her. It seems like, and that's what I kind of liked about. Um, I think in your talk you mentioned that cat on her head, on the um, not her head, but on that figure's head, and in the big girl. And it's like it's almost like she just doesn't even you know. It's like she's so reflective or so in thought that it's like she's got bigger, you know, bigger things to worry about. <laughs> Multiple cats, Chips, on her head, you know. there's cats on her head and there's a cat around her neck. And I think about the outfit that that woman is wearing in the big girl. And so <laughs> as we're talking about sort of the rules and, and exceeding the boundaries of those rules. I keep coming back to the, the town, the suburb that Gladys Nilsson lives in that honestly, I never knew she lived there. She moved there. I would have been, I think, maybe heading out for college when she lived there or when she moved there. I'm not sure exactly, but I certainly had no idea. And I found out actually by reading a New York Times article about her. And when I saw that this is where she lived, I think I just kind of, you know, my jaw dropped. And I started imagining, you know, these women in that community and thinking about this woman and big girl with that great polka dot blouse and that um, little skirt and those shorts peeking out underneath and those shoes and thinking that's just not how you dress when you go walking down the street in that town right there there are certain codes of behavior for you know older white ladies in that town and um, it's just not it's just not happening in Gladys Nilsson's work and so for me, there's that extra layer of this kind of, Carrie, I'm just going to keep using your word, unapologetic, almost subversion of those rules. And so that's why 
you know, I think about these figures just you know, dancing out of that house, out of that attic studio into those quiet, tree-lined, cobblestone streets where things are kind of proper. Yeah. And, these works just aren't, <laughs> and it just, I love yeah. that. I love that. I, um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I like thinking of the word improper and, and her, these characters that populate her paintings and, um, uh, I think they've been described as mischievous or kind of, you know, up to no good or, um, and I, I love that. They really are larger than life. And I like the idea of picturing them like out in the world. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. really fun. Um, when you were uh, preparing uh, your talk and, and looking through the show and thinking about Nelson's work, um, did you learn anything that um, surprised you or anything that was, uh, that you want to share anything interesting that you learned besides the fact that where she lived yeah <laughs> in her house a hundred times <laughs> you're shook from that <laughs> it was like a mile from my parents house I'm just saying um so I think I think what I learned from really looking closely at her work goes back to your earlier question about materials because I was familiar with her work, but I hadn't really sat with it and looked at the way she handles paint and the way that she works with line and pattern and texture and bringing different materials together in a way that makes all of this kind of gleeful exuberance look so easy. When you look at the images, it looks so easy, but then you kind of sit with one of her paintings for a while or one of her etchings for a while. And this consummate understanding of these materials that takes a long time and a lot of work to understand how to use them in a way that gets at that sense of loose, playful spontaneity, that doesn't just happen. And so one of the things that I learned in looking at her work is how her, I think her deep understanding of how to work with these materials frees her to do what she wants to do with them in her art. She's not limited by having to kind of stop and think about what's possible with those materials because she knows. Yeah, definitely. Um, we have uh, another question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you viewers for asking questions. It's great. Um, uh, Alejandra asks uh, or says, this is a new topic uh, for me. As I'm listening to this, it makes me think also of how not only she has changed as an artist, younger and older self. Also the roles of women and beauty and how it has changed uh, over time. What was considered old in the past, for instance. At what uh, age one was considered old as opposed to now. Same with gender roles and how natural beauty and aging standards were back then and now. I hope my comment makes sense. Women are taking more ownership to aging differently today than they did at her younger time. So more of a, a reflection on, on this question of aging and, and perceptions of aging. And, you know. Yeah, and, I, and Alejandra, I think that the point that you're making is really insightful because when Gladys Nilsson was younger, I think not only was she not thinking about representing the aging body because she was younger and she didn't occupy an aging body, I think also it has to do perhaps with the cultural expectations and those kinds of changes in visibility of people in expectations, visibility of women, of aging women, um, expectations for what aging looked like, sort of how one performs aging, if you will, um, what sorts of images you see in popular culture, in women's magazines, all of, you know, fashion, all of those kinds of spaces. I think that you're right, that aging looks different and is performed differently. I think there are also still elements of kind of invisibility that happened to older women. I mean, I look at this hair, right? Folks, you can see me sitting here. You saw me on the screen. 
And there's a thing that happens where you sometimes become invisible. You become not seen when you get gray hair um, or when you let your gray hair be gray hair, I should say. Um, and I think that while a lot has changed and while um, certainly the idea of what, you know, what the different categories are, like at what age you're old, I think a lot has changed. I think there are also still ways in which there are um, expectations for aging women that I see Nilsen continuing to push against. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And thank you, Alejandra, for your question or your comment rather. Um, I don't, we don't have any other questions right now in the chat. Um, is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, is there anything else anybody else? I want to throw it back to our audience. Um, the audience, we can oh, wait. I'm like, I have time. <laughs> I don't know how long you want to you want to stay here on the screen, but is what um, if there's anything anybody else wants to add? Yeah. Before we wrap this up. Uh, we have a, a, a few comments. Um, well, Donna just, just noted, she uh, said, I really appreciate the insights about invisibility. And um, I do too. And I, I think it's also nice of you to share, you know, your own experience with that. And, um, you know, with Nelson's work, it's like these, these women are hyper visible, right? They're kind of, um, you know, larger than life. And so I think that's a kind of a nice undoing of that. Um, of that. And I, I think we have another uh, comment coming in. Okay. Just okay. okay, so um, Susan says, you mentioned that she uses a wide variety of media. Do you see patterns or, not quite sure how to ask this one, reasons why she chose one medium or another for certain subjects or certain works. I would, I'm would. i not sure I see a pattern. I would have to think about that more. But I think that when she wanted color, you know, when something needed color, she used the paints that have the color. When she felt like something needed tonality and texture and pattern, she went for, say, etching, um, whether it's the um, kind of draw, hard ground drawn etchings or dry points, or when she was going with the tonality of aquatint or the really interesting additional layer that comes from Chine Collet because of that la the layers of paper that come together in that print medium. I think it may be that she started off with the medium and then the image came. But I do think that there seemed to be in her work, and I would love to be able to ask her this, um, times when color seems to be necessary. Color seems to be what maybe enlivens an image. And so the work asks for that. And this is one of the things that is so great about her being able to handle all of these mediums is she can go for the one that's that's what she wants that speaks to whatever that image seems to need. I think also that as somebody who teaches in a variety of mediums and works with students who are working in a variety of mediums, I would guess that sometimes something comes to her as she's engaging with students as well as looking at other art, as looking at other kinds of visual culture, visual material in the world. And perhaps something comes to her as she's demonstrating something to a student. So um, I know for, for those of us who are here who teach, at least for me, there's always so much that I learn from my students and ways that I get inspired by students. And so I wonder as well if there isn't something in her choice of medium for particular works that has to do with something that's going on in that aspect of the life. Yeah, thank you, Susan, for that, um, for that question. Um, Sarah says, 
I'm feeling interested in the interaction between her larger figures and the little people in her paintings. It seems as if her own take on the world is so strong and fills the world of the page so fully that these other beings' agendas and opinions, no matter how compelling, are allowed to be present but can only be little and on the edges. Hmm. So I wonder about those little, I wonder if some of those little figures in some paintings or etchings or other works become big figures in other ones. I wonder if they get different roles in different stories. Some of them maybe always stay little. I mean, I'm thinking about like the little tiny man in the painting with the dog and the leash. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of her figures though, maybe get to play a different part at some point because she is thinking so much about this question of scale. So Sarah, thank you for, for asking us to think about this because there are the larger than life figures and then there are smaller figures and then there are really teeny figures. Mm -hmm. So they all have different parts in the story and it may be that some of those smaller figures who pull us in close invite us into a kind of intimacy with the image where if we're just engaging with the giant figure, we're maybe gonna stand back more. So it's like we come into the layers, we come into the differences in scale in these works in a way that our own body approaches the work and then steps back from the work. So perhaps it's a way of thinking about the different stories that are being told. And then how does one story move Right, just like there are these, bound, these social boundaries that her figures exceed. I wonder if some of these figures and the stories they suggest maybe aren't bound by the edges of that image and they hop on into another story. I love that idea of, of these characters being kind of recast or breaking these narratives and um, joining you know, groups of other people, like this idea of them jumping between paintings or something, that's really fun. When you were asking before about what I had learned from, from looking at her work and being with her work, one of the things I was so conscious of when I went into the gallery to see this show the first time was this idea of my own bodily presence with the work that of course we lose when we see them you know, in a reproduction, which is why I'm so happy that there's a 3D gallery view mm -hmm. on the MOCA website because I found myself stepping back to take in the really big figures, the figures that were bigger than me, and then moving in really close to see the little teeny figures where there are figures and, and little doorways opening into other kinds of magical spaces that call into question what's going on in the bigger space. So my own physical self engages with these works by moving in close to see them. And I think also in terms of that, that idea of scale and those little figures as you move in close and they then draw our attention to another space, another landscape, another world where there's a, maybe a whole other story being suggested, those little tiny figures all of a sudden take on some power by being able to do that because they pull us into the next world beyond the work of art that we think we have apprehended, but then there's a whole other world in that work of art that calls that bigger world and that first one that we see into question and that maybe suggests the world that we're gonna see in another one of the paintings. Absolutely, I think, um, I think of the, you know, the title of the exhibition being Out of This World and um, these little portals that you see in, in several of our paintings and um, exactly that, how those characters, these figures, um, you know, kind of your eye is already moving around the painting. I mean, these compositions are so complex and, and you know, rhythmic and um, to have these, these tiny figures kind of pull you in and, and invite you elsewhere, I think is really a, a real treat. Um, and uh, Sarah says, <clears throat> thanks for the answer. Now I wonder why on earth I thought that size related to importance. Um, and in my head, I'm thinking of like, uh, like Egyptian hieroglyphs or something. And you have, you know, the elites, the um, the most important people, right, are, are literally scaled, you know, um, to be larger in size. And that kind of indicated this power and this status. And, um, and Sarah, so I would say, I think you could still read it, you know, 
that way, I think that could be part of it, right? But mm -hmm. I think it can be that, and it can also simultaneously be subverted by those little figures leading us out of this world into this other world in, in the work of art. So I think that's a thing about Gladys Nilsson. There's some of that layered complexity, ambiguity, where it's both. The largest figure does draw our attention as the most important figure. And those little figures have some importance beyond their size. So it's a kind of simultaneous, it's a multiplicity, I think, in how she's asking us to look at these works of art. Definitely. Um, thank you to everyone who's asked questions so far. Um, I think we're getting towards the end um, of, of this Q&A. Uh, thanks for your time already, Melanie. Um, I guess one question I had was, um, I think you mentioned early on something about recurring uh, you know, thematic elements or objects or things that kind of appear um, across Gladys's work. Um, is there, are there kind of um, interesting like recurring elements that you see kind of make an appearance? Like does she have favorite um, objects or I see cats and dogs and things like that and purses and, and the iconic kind of, you know, heel shoe, but um, I'm curious what you found in her work that you've noticed. In terms of those kind of iconic images, I think some of what you've just said, I think about the cats, of course, I think about the dogs, I think about those kind of signifiers of femininity, like the purses, the shoes, the clothing. Um, I also think about that juxtaposition of natural world, human made world, where one sometimes slides into the other, or maybe they're set side by side and with an interesting relationship between them. Um, I think another motif, it's not so much a kind of object-based motif, but that idea of scale and space and ways in which the smaller figures in a work are doing something that may or may not on first look seem to have anything to do with the bigger figure but then we realize that it's expanding the narrative. It's adding to the story. Or we see the smaller figures looking at the body of the larger figure. So it's almost like there's this curiosity happening. Mm -hmm. I think that maybe the curiosity is, is one of these motifs. I mean, I know I'm certainly curious about all those cats on top of that woman's head, <laughs> big girl. I'm curious about the worlds within worlds within worlds that she takes us out of this world. Um, yeah, all of that together. Wonderful. Well, I think that's a great place to end uh, Out of This World by Gladys Nilsson. Um, this exhibition is on view through June 6th, um, 2021 at MOCA, the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, this has been a virtual visit. Um, Melanie Herzog, thank you so much for joining us and for giving that wonderful talk. And to Marion, who's related to you, is that right? Yes, Marion is my daughter. That's awesome. Yeah, she put together this lovely video um, that is on our website as well. And there's a 3D uh, virtual tour that you can check out um, of this exhibition. And if you do visit the museum, please uh, wear a mask and uh, keep your distance and don't stay too long. <laughs> Enjoy the work, but you know, stay at home, folks. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Melanie. And um, our next virtual visit is going to be uh, next Friday, uh, the 30th, with Richard Axum. He's going to be talking about Jim Cagle's uh, exhibition. So we hope to see you all there. Um, so thank you, Melanie. Appreciate you being here. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed this immensely. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening.